Okay, welcome to learning to trade a trading range. Uh, today, what I plan to do is to take a look at a few different types of ranges. Uh, we'll start with channels, I'll go through uh, rectangular consolidation patterns, and then take a look at triangles. Uh, I plan to go through the major indices uh, to uh, help identify what a channel looks like. And then uh, we'll get into some specific examples on uh, consolidation patterns and triangles. And then uh, toward the end of this presentation, I'll take a look at some of the more active stocks on the S&P 500 and uh, just trying to highlight some of the different patterns that I've discussed. So let's take a look first at the S&P 500. I would suggest that when you take a look at channels that you make sure that you have the log scale checked here at the bottom of the chart attributes, because if you don't have the log scale checked, and you uncheck that and you have an arithmetic scale, the channels, and I'll annotate this so you can see, but the channels are not gonna line up. And I'll explain that in one minute, but let's just annotate from the low back in 2011 through the low in early 2016. And the way you can um, look for channels is once you have a line established, you can put the cursor over that line and hit command and the left click, and you can then drag the same slope. Now, if you look at this on the S&P 500, notice that the uh, highs don't connect when I do this. So it appears like we're not in a channel, but keep in mind, this is an arithmetic scale and arithmetic scales, the difference between these and the logarithmic is the uh, arithmetic, you can see the same distance between every 200 points. So say from 800 to 1,000, that's a 25% difference. But from say uh, 2,000 to 2,200, that's only a 10% difference. And yet the spacing is the same. Uh, that's not really conducive or set up to drawing channel lines. So let's uh, move back out of this. And let's uh, take a look at that S&P 500 chart again. Now, now this is a uh, logarithmic scale. And on the logarithmic scale, what you have is uh, the distance between points are based on percentages and not the points themselves. So for instance, 800 to 1,000, the difference there is 25%, 200 points. 200 divided by 800 gives you 25%. If you wanted to look, say, between 2,400 and 25% higher than that, that would be 600 points up to 3,000. The spacing between 2,400 and 3,000 would be identical to 800 and 1,000. So your percentage gains are represented on the chart by the same spacing. And that's really important when you're doing channeling or drawing uh, channel lines. So here you can see on the chart, the S&P 500 has channeled beautifully in the way one of the things you could have looked at back in early 2016, and I realize some of this is hindsight, but if we uh, take a look at the annotation here, and let's just say we get rid of this other line, this bottom uptrend channel line, and let's say all we had were these tops that were touching one another. Well, this was a pretty important low that we had back in 2011. So when we started going through this period of weakness in 2015 and into 2016, one thing you can do is kind of take a look in, into the future and maybe get an idea of where we can go and still be okay within a channel. So I'm gonna grab this line, left click on the command button on a Mac. And if I draw it exactly where this candle body is here on the left side, notice that that ended up coming up beautifully and hitting that low in early 2016. So the channel here was kind of drawn for us before the bottom ever formed. It was a, a place that we could have looked for some weakness and the top of the channel is where we can look maybe for strength uh, running out of steam. Back in January when we had to move up in the S&P 500, you can see we got pretty close to that channel line, didn't quite get there and then we pulled back and currently we're in the middle of this channel. If we continue to draw this line out, uh, we would be roughly at about 2450-ish uh, to the downside. And if we take this on the upside, 
And just keep in mind channel lines, trend lines, and so forth are not exact, uh, but they can give you a, a general sense. Uh, I would say we're probably in the upper end of their, this range, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 32, 3300 on the S&P 500. So the current range, even if we say 2,500 to the downside, we've got 2,500 to 3,300 to remain in this channel, currently trading at 2,858, so we do have room to the upside. So just wanted to explain first how you can draw those, uh, those channel lines, and uh, they're even somewhat uh, predictive in terms of trying to catch tops and bottoms. The next one is the Russell 2000, and the Russell 2000, going back the last uh, nine or 10 years, uh, I actually did draw this bottom trend line using the two bottoms that we already know. And I've used the high that we saw back in 2014 as the top of this channel to get some sense of where maybe we could go on the Russell 2000 and remain in a long-term channel here. Uh, it's hard to guess exactly, but it would be somewhere, I'm guessing probably close to 2000 would be the upper end of this channel if we were to draw this out and extend the chart to the upside. But clearly it's well above 1700, which is where the Russell 2000 is uh, trading on this chart. Okay, let's talk a little bit. That, that just gives you a sense of the channels, but I wanna talk a little bit about rectangular consolidation. And uh, let's take a look at SORL, which is Sorrel Auto Parts uh, stock. And um, I like to do, uh, I like to trade trading ranges uh, many times off of earnings. And in this case, you can see SORL had gapped up on very heavy volume back in November of 2017, and also did the same thing, gapping up on very heavy volume, earnings-related volume in the middle of May of 2018. And off of both of these moves to the upside, we pulled back after the earnings report. Uh, those of you who are candlestick fans know that that black candle off of an uptrend, a steep uptrend, tends to mark tops. And we saw it not only back in November, but we also saw it here in May. So the question then is, once we see that potential reversal, where are we going to go, go back to the downside? Where do we look for support? Um, many times you say, well, it's going to fill the gap. And of course, you know, you get back down here to prior high. The gap actually came down a little bit lower, would have been down to about $6. But that prior high candle body was about six and a quarter. So that would have been some uh, support. That was resistance. We had pulled back off of that prior to earnings. We gap above it, and then that creates the support level there at about six and a quarter. So in this case, Sorrel, after gapping up with earnings, came back, tested that gap support level, and then turned back to the upside. Well, that doesn't always happen. And I want you to take a look at what happened in mid-May. We gapped up, printed that black candle. Notice we didn't hold at gap support. We continued moving lower. So one of my strategies is simply to watch to see how far a stock will drop after it comes out with excellent earnings report. Uh, many times these stocks will pull back and establish a price support range. And that's what I look for. In this case, back in November, after gapping up with earnings, we pulled back and we established a low at the uh, price support level near six and a quarter. And notice after establishing that level, we bounced back up and got very close to the prior open, which was up above $8 before turning back down. Uh, throughout this move back to the upside, these pullbacks, we had a rising 20-day moving average, which was holding a support. So you certainly could trade that support level, um, but keeping in mind that your target is going to be up close to that eight and a quarter, uh, maybe about 815, 810 level, something like that. Uh, now, when I'm trading, if I get close to my resistance level, I'm not looking to the penny. If I have a pretty nice profit and I'm getting close to resistance, I tend to take my profits, move back to the sidelines. So just watch uh, uh, your stocks as they get near support. And especially in this case, we had a couple of different times where we got up just below $8 and then turned back to the downside. So that establishes some pretty good resistance at that level. Now I circled this area over here because we did pull back and hit this prior support level. Not only did we do that, but we also put in a reversing uh, bullish, well, it's hard to say if that's bullish engulfing, maybe it's a piercing candle. Uh, you might call it a hammer, although I think that's a little bit of a stretch. Normally the hammer, you have the candle body only in the top one third of the uh, candlestick. In this case, it's really the top half. But I would still say that this is either a piercing or a bear, or excuse me, bullish engulfing candle. So you're getting this reversal. You had a false breakdown with that tail going down below six and a quarter, 
came back up, we closed well above that support level. I would have expected a nice bounce off of that. Uh, but the reason I did mention this one is that we uh, failed to hold that support level and ended up breaking down. And this is a, a testament why you need to make sure you keep your stops in play. Just because a trade looks good doesn't mean it's always going to play out the way you expect. Uh, in this case, SORL did fall back below, move back up again, and then resume a downtrend. Um, the next real opportunity on the long side, in my opinion, was after they reported earnings in mid or excuse me, mid-May. Gapped up, traded as high as uh, almost $7, came back down, reversed, finished at about five sixty, and again, off of a steep uptrend with earnings, big volume, had a reversing candle, that black candle. Now, this case, SORL fell all the way back down to about four fifty, and established this low right where it had had a prior support area. So after moving higher in late April into early May, we pulled back multiple days held right around the 450 level before we started that last final uptrend before earnings. Uh, we came back down on SORL to the 450 level right at the support area and then made a bounce. When it topped out, and of course you don't know on the way up where it's gonna top out, but once it tops out and starts rolling back over, your trading range has been established. So your prior low becomes support, the high becomes resistance, and I want you to look at SORL, how it has traded uh, throughout the months of June and July and into August. Uh, that high at five and a quarter was tested at the end of July, and it held. We started rolling back down to the downside. The low that was established in late May, notice we came down in that blue circle. I want you to take a look at that candlestick. That is a hammer. So intraday, it looked like we were breaking down which should trigger a lot of stops, but instead we had buyers coming in at the end of the day, likely market makers, and they held the stock back up above price support. And sure enough, that was a solid support area. Anything around that 450 area on entry would be awesome because if you did hold it until you got the resistance at five and a quarter, we're talking about a 75 cent gain on a 450 stock, which is probably roughly about 17% or so. A very, very solid gain. Uh, for sure on SORL. Next up is OKTA. This is OK, OKTA Inc. And uh, stock off of an uptrend. And these uh, trading ranges can take many different shapes. After an uptrend like this, when I sideways consolidate or stock sideways consolidates, I'm expecting that prior trend to continue. I look for this to be a continuation pattern sideways. So as you hit price support. You could certainly take profits when you hit the prior highs or price resistance, but I would actually be looking at uh, potentially at some point down the road a breakout. Uh, here is your clear uptrend. We establish a high at the beginning of June. We come back down. We set a low, which by the way coincided with a couple of previous lows near the 4750 level. Here is a piercing candle. That's a reversing candle off of a downtrend. And sure enough, from there, we go all the way back up to the prior high and test that resistance level. At the top, look at that candle. I didn't circle it there, but that is a bearish engulfing candle right at the top. And I want you to check out the volume on this. So we had the potential of a breakout, but we reversed off of an uptrend. Next day, we were all the way back down from 57 and a half the day before, maybe even 58, all the way back down to 47 and a half or 48 to test the bottom of this range before turning back to the upside. Now I can tell you that during these couple of days, few days, software stocks were under a lot of pressure and OKTA is in that group. And uh, despite all the weakness, OKTA, despite all the weakness in the overall group, OKTA was able to hold on to its key price support level. And so as you get a stock that pulls back, even if it's on heavy volume, if it's got excellent support, that is a very solid reward to risk entry point that you should consider. All right, let's take a look at the triangles. Um, here is the Invesco S&P Small Cap Financials ETF. First of all, financials were performing exceptionally well, especially the small caps back in April and May, moving higher. Off of this uptrend, I talked about you know con continuation patterns, and that's exactly what a triangle is. So off of an uptrend, you can see multiple tests of highs, equal highs, and you've got rising lows. And that is uh, considered an ascending triangle. So this is a different kind of a range that you could potentially trade. Once you see a low established, 
you come back down. Notice also these uh, lows are holding on to the 50-day moving average. So as these lows are established and we start moving back up toward the top of the triangle, it becomes a sell at the top of the triangle. And as it comes back down and tests the trend line, it becomes a buy. Um, now, if you wanted to be a little more conservative, maybe you could do a half of a buy. And if we were to go all the way back down to the prior low and establish like a sideways consolidation, rectangular consolidation, you could add a second entry, say at 57. There's no guarantee when you're in one of these patterns that the triangle is gonna hold. So the point here is you have to be prepared potentially for a break of this triangle. And if it breaks, you could simply just get out of the trade. Uh, but I would at least be aware the fact that we had this uptrend, sideways consolidation can also be a continuation pattern. So it doesn't have to evolve only into a triangle. It could fall back to 57, test the support level, side, go sideways for a while, and then make the breakout. Both of these patterns would be equally bullish. All right, one other triangle pattern here, and this is the XLI industrials. Um, off of, this is a weekly chart. And dating back to this multiple bottom support here at about 45, we had been going sideways for really the better part of two years. Finally, off of this move to the downside, this uh, test of support, we began an uptrend. And throughout this uptrend, uh, essentially we were stair-stepping. So we move up, we consolidate, we break out, we consolidate, we break out, continue trending higher, and eventually topped in January of 2018. If you take that top in January 2018 and you take the low, the previous low, before the last move to the upside, that establishes the two key points in this case for a symmetrical triangle. So I just talked about an ascending triangle where you have equal highs and rising lows. A symmetrical triangle is where you have uh, declining highs and rising lows and you just continue to squeeze uh, into a more and more narrow triangle. Eventually, what you expect off of this triangle pattern, similar to the ascending uh, triangle pattern, is you look for a breakout. This is a continuation pattern. So the XLI here uh, in late July, early August, making this breakout of this trend line, to me this is a very bullish breakout of a, a continuation pattern, the symmetrical triangle pattern. Okay, I wanna go through and just take a look at a few stocks, and I have not previously looked at these. I just wanna to try to identify the different patterns that we uh, have talked about here so far. So let's pull up first uh, Advanced Micro Devices, AMD. Okay, AMD, when I'm looking at this chart, I'm gonna uh, stretch these out so we get a little bit more data, but let's take a look at a one-year chart. And I think when you look at a one-year chart, you see a couple of things. First, we established some pretty important highs back in September and October, and it took all the way until late May, early June. Actually, it was early June before we finally broke out above that prior high. So all of this is considered consolidation. We had a nice move up December and January, but notice the rally ended before we could get a breakout. So resistance, gap resistance, price resistance uh, was still a problem back then. Um, but what I'm really looking at here is another uh, consolidation pattern off of this uptrend, another continuation pattern, which is a cup with handle. Off of the beautiful move up here, I think it's pretty clear we had an uptrend. We come down into this rounded cup. We e set equal highs on the right side versus the left side, pull back into a handle, and then we make the big breakout here on very heavy volume to the upside. So AMD, is, this is another type of pattern but it is consolidating for a, for a period of time within a range before it makes its breakout. Bank of America. Okay, Bank of America. Now in this case, we're actually consolidating within a bullish wedge. And a bullish wedge, I'll annotate this so you can see this, is really where you have these higher, or excuse me, lower highs so we can connect those, those lower highs. And then also you have these lower lows. Uh, this one's almost a channel, but not quite. It's actually squeezing a little bit as you get further and further toward the right side here. But this is all coming after a very sizable uptrend. And so what you're looking for here is during this period of consolidation in this range, uh, you may or may not have some good uh, trading opportunities. For instance, 
I could circle that, uh, and actually I will, got a nice hammer that uh, came in at the prior support area. We went just a tad below it on an intraday basis, but we came back up and we held support at about the, that would have been the $29 level. And I can give you a horizontal line here to show you exactly what I'm looking at there. So here was your prior low. You can see a lot of support right at about $29 on Bank of America. Intraday, we went all the way down to about 2830 and then came back up, leaving that tail down below support. That was a false breakdown. That reversal, look what happened. We went right back to that prior high. Bank of America from $29 went back up to $31 or roughly six, 7% in less than two weeks or right about two weeks. Uh, that's a nice trade in a sideways consolidation pattern. Uh, we went back down again, held on to this area of support, took one more bounce, and then finally looked like maybe we were breaking down before we came back up and broke this wedge. And uh, the volume on the break to the upside, I think is pretty strong, certainly a better than average volume. And now we have a stock that is trending higher, looking to me like we're gonna make a run back for that March high near $33. Let's take a look. I'm going to pull up the MOS mosaic. And you can see sideways consolidation here. This is a really good one. I'm going to still stre uh, stretch it out to a year chart. Okay, a couple things to notice here on this chart. First, I'm going to annotate again to show, make sure you see this. But Notice these prior lows here. As we began this uptrend, it's always important to look to see where the prior pullback uh, holds in terms of support. And the reason for that is that an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows, sometimes equal lows, but you don't want to see lower lows. That starts to look like a chart rolling over. So in this case, when we broke out above this prior high at about 27 and a half, we pulled back to that 27 and a half level and then took off again, set a new high. Notice when we pulled back, we held 27 and a half again. So that creates opportunities on the long side to um, get in on a support level. And then what you're looking for is a move back to test the upper end of the range. Now, we don't know for sure that it's gonna break out, although that would be my guess because we are in an uptrend. But I'm just interested in capturing the buy at support and the sell at resistance. This is another perfect example from 27 and a half up to nearly $30, could have been done in about two, three weeks. And you're talking about, uh, what, eight, 9% in um, you know, half a month. Pretty impressive gains. All right, let me do one more. And uh, let's, pull up, um, let's pull up Apple. Everyone likes to look at Apple. Um, I can tell you that the breakout that occurred back in May, and you know, when you start talking about where a stock might pull back to, one of the first things you should be thinking about is where was the prior high? Here was the prior high at about 182, and here's the breakout right here. Look at the volume confirming that breakout. So normally that will establish support at that prior resistance level. Take a look at where we came back down to. Now, again, if I'm trading a range on Apple, stock gets up to 195, pulls all the way back to 182 to test the support level, I can get in here with a fairly tight stop with a $13 profit target back to 195. That's roughly, I don't know, 7% or so. And in this case, after hitting support and bouncing, it made that 7% move in about three to four weeks. So these are just some of the examples I think that you can use to uh, try to better your, your range trading. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities and when one stock is breaking out, you have many others that are consolidating and in trading ranges. Um, but the ones that I find most powerful for me are stocks that are pulling back, go below support intraday, but then come back and rally above by the close. That normally establishes a really tight stop beneath the low that day and then gives you all the way back up to the most recent price high uh, resistance in order to establish your target. And as long as your reward to risk is at least two to one based on that uh, trading range, then it would seem to me like it's a pretty good trade. Hope you enjoyed the session and best of luck in your trading.